She was the glue that kept everyone together. 911, where is your emergency? But Shirley Carter was shot twice in her kitchen. Has DCI found Bill Carter's bolt action rifle? No, we have not. The lead investigator told local law enforcement to stop following up on those leads. Did you seize the gun safe? No. Every pursuit should have been thoroughly examined, explored. There's a hole through the floor in the refrigerator. Do you what happened? If you've ever been to Iowa, you know that much of the state is farmland. Corn, soybeans, pork, eggs. There are over 80,000 farms in the Hawkeye State. One of those farms, not far from Des Moines, in Lacona, belonged to Bill and Shirley Carter. They met in high school, got married young, and had three children together, Bill Jr., Jana, and Jason. They did everything together, including working their farm, until June 19, 2015. Growing up in a small town, I always envisioned Lacona to be very much like where I grew up, where everyone kind of knew other people's business and everyone either knew someone had a good reputation or a bad reputation. Most of them are farmers, their families are farmers, they've been there for generations. That's how the town is. Bill Carter uh, was a farmer and, and had farmed his whole life. He grew up in that community. He raised three children in that community. Bill struck me as a very simple man, and their house was a very simple house. As far as I could tell, it had never been remodeled. It was essentially the same as it was the day they walked in the door in 1960. So that shows you the frugalness of um, his everyday life. Shirley helped Bill on the farm. There was a time when Bill described to us that he and Shirley were partners. They farmed together. She would drive ahead of him and he would plant behind her. That was how they did things. Bill and Shirley were both farmers. Uh, there is a distinction between being a farm wife and being a farmer. Jason especially was close with his parents because he farmed uh, and they worked together. And his wife, Shelley, was close with Shirley and Bill. She was the glue that kept everyone together. She was one of the most giving people that, you know, I've ever met. She didn't like attention. Um, she wasn't showy. She just embraced the love. I remember her going sledding with us. I just remember her screaming, going down the hill, thinking that she was <laughs> she was going to crash, go off. <laughs> go off in the ditch, down in the <laughs> creek. And uh, she was always really... It was, it was funny listening to her go down the hill and her voice just keep getting higher. Shirley and Billy had a, you know, a very traditional um, relationship where Billy um, made a lot of the decisions. And um, she, he called Shirley mama. I mean, the kids were the light of her life. She worked hard, but she liked to have fun too. Mm -hmm. And we made a lot of memories together. June 19th, 2015, Bill and Shirley got up. They went and got their coffee. They did their morning thing. They came back, and it was time for Bill to haul grain. He said he drank decaf, and she drank caffeinated coffee, so they didn't drink it together at home. They would go out for coffee, and then he dropped her at home, and then he went off to do some corn hauling. On June 19th, 2015, I was hauling grain that day, and uh, started the semi, ran into town, headed for Pleasantville to Casey's. Got something to eat or drink for breakfast and went back, got in the semi and uh, took it to Cargill, to the corn processing plant. Dropped the load off there and headed back to Heberlands to park the semi. Got in the pickup and anyway, it was a nice day out. Just took my time getting there and uh, parked the pickup by the fuel barrel and 
went to walk inside and walked through the door and found my mom laying on the floor. She had blood around her side, and I could definitely tell she was she had been gone for a while. You know, I couldn't figure out what happened at first. She, you know, I called my sister to tell her, you know, what I just found, and she asked me if I'd called 911, and I said no. And she said, well, call 911, and then she hung up, and then I called 911. 911, where is your emergency? Yeah, I, I need that. I need, I need an ambulance, Dad. It's Bill Carter, and I, I his son, and my mom. My mom was laying here on the floor. What? Where is she, Dad? And I don't know what happened. The law enforcement officers said that they didn't know if someone had simply just picked a house and, you know, tried to rob them and killed, or if this was more personal, if this was a family member. Made like no other. June 19, 2015, started out like any other day on the farm for the Carter family in Lacona, Iowa, running errands, doing farm chores, hauling crops, but by noon, their daily routine took a deadly turn. Shirley Carter was shot twice in her kitchen, and Jason Carter was the first person to discover the body. There were at least two shots fired from the area of the doorway. The first into Shirley, it went through her body before coming to rest in the refrigerator. The second bullet was fired into Shirley's body while she was laying on the floor. Shirley was at the house doing chores, according to Bill, and then he gets a call from his daughter, Jana, saying that Jason called her Shirley's been shot, and Bill needed to call 911. Hello? 911, where is your emergency? Uh, Street at Lacona. Uh, my, my son just called and said he found my wife dead on the floor in the kitchen. Okay. Um, we do have an ambulance on the way there now. He showed up, you know, pretty quick-like, and, uh, he walked through the door, and I just remember him kneeling down, and he said, oh, mama. And he knelt down, and uh, he, he kissed her on the forehead. Very quickly after that, however, the police came and kind of shooed, shooed him out of the house and closed closed up the house as a crime scene, so he was not able to go back in for quite a while to look at the evidence. Police were called to a home along Street outside Lacona around noon today. There they found a body of a person inside this home. Police are not saying how the person died. The Division of Criminal Investigation is also helping with the case. I remember standing in the dining room uh, doorway you could see blood was around her side, but you could not tell where she had been shot. I turned around and I could see uh, drawers were pulled open. There, you know, everything in the dining room was just a mess. And uh, that's when I told my dad, I said, you know, you know so you've been robbed and they've shot mom. Shirley had been shot twice. The first shot took off the bottom of her heart. The second disintegrated her heart. Jason came in from the deck and showed him a bullet hole in the fridge. Jason was hysterical and... Um, yeah, I tried calling everybody. He, and he... I even called our neighbor, the sheriff, the local sheriff. Bill got a phone call from not his son, Jason, but his daughter, Jana. Why hadn't the first phone call been to 911? And why hadn't Jason called him directly? 
I really don't find anything suspicious about his call to his sister before his call to 911, especially because Shirley was obviously dead. She was not in distress. I think that was probably clear to him. Certainly um, the same thing. When Bill arrived on the scene, he didn't try to resuscitate because they both knew. The community was very shocked. Most everybody usually trusts everybody. It was hard for anyone to feel very safe after this happened. And the law enforcement officers said that they were kind of at a loss. They didn't really have any leads at the time. There was claims that the house had been, you know, ransacked. There was things everywhere. And so they didn't know if someone had simply just picked a house and, you know, tried to rob them and kill Shirley, or if this was more personal, if this was a family member. The allegation that the crime scene looked like a staged burglary certainly made sense initially. As time went by, we realized that we don't know that nothing was taken. We don't know what happened. One of the first things we noticed is that the prescription drugs and the jewelry boxes on Shirley's dresser were completely undisturbed. Also, Shirley's purse had cash sitting just inside the purse on top of all of the other contents that had not been taken. So realistically, it appeared early on that someone had taken the opportunity to stage the scene so it would look like a home invasion burglary, but um, the evidence wasn't there to support that. For months and months, law enforcement were still investigating, had not arrested anyone. Agent Ludwig was the agent in charge, so he is the one who led the investigation, guided it, and told people what they could or couldn't do. Mark Ludwig had previous law enforcement experience. I believe he was a Iowa State Trooper, and then he moved up to become an agent with the Division of Criminal Investigation. The investigation turned towards Jason early on. They state that Jason lied to them. He knew more information about the murder scene than he should have. And he arrived at the scene much sooner than he stated he arrived. He was accused, um, at least by investigators, they, he was looked at as a suspect and their prime suspect. There was a gun safe and a missing murder weapon. Bill's theory at the time was that Jason actually planned to kill both of them because he stood to inherit this money that otherwise Bill would have inherited Shirley's share of. At free for 30 days. On June 19, 2015, 68-year-old Shirley Carter was found dead on the floor of her farmhouse kitchen in Lacona, Iowa. Most people in the area never even locked their doors, so neighbors were stunned by the brutality of this crime. They wanted to know who did this and why. The lead investigator, Mark Ludwig of Iowa's Division of Criminal Investigation, set his sights on a primary suspect early on. Jason Carter, Shirley and Bill's son, who discovered the body. And over the course of the investigation, Bill Carter, Jason's dad, began to think his son was guilty as well. In the beginning, I think everyone was just in so much shock because it was such a tragedy. But as Mark Ludwig continued to work Bill, my father-in-law, and continue to convince him more and more that Jason was responsible. My father-in-law got more and more vocal. I think there were various reasons for Bill's suspicions. One of them had to do with money, that Jason stood to inherit the family farm and all the money that went into that. Another that he hadn't been aware of, but when he hired a private detective, he learned Jason had been having an affair with somebody else and that that might have been an impetus for Shirley to have gotten angry with him and this to have ensued. 
In this particular case, there was no indication that she was alarmed or tried to flee. So given that information, it was possible that the killer was someone she knew. We examined Jason as well. Jason was actually found to be at the, at the house on the day that it occurred. He had means. He um, was also found to have a motive. It all stems from Mark Ludwig. He was the lead investigator on my mom's case. It all stems from him listening to my 911 call on his way to the scene and making his decision that I was his prime suspect. I mean, he must have had the biggest blind set of blinders ever. Bill's theory at the time was that Jason actually planned to kill both of them because he stood to inherit this money that otherwise Bill would have inherited Shirley's share of. And he thinks that he just didn't come in at the right time to the house, wasn't there at the right time, or both of them would have been killed. The weapon that was used was consistent with a high-powered weapon. In this particular case, there was a weapon missing from the residence, which was a Remington Model 77 270 caliber bolt-action rifle. In the Carter house, there was this gun safe that Jason said he didn't really know anything about, but it was actually a gift from him and Shelly Carter. His fingerprints were all over it. Jason said he had never touched the gun safe where that rifle was stored. However, evidence shows he assembled it himself. And if you look at where these fingerprints were, they're inside the locking mechanism and in places where if you were assembling a gun safe, you would touch to assemble. I still don't remember to this day us getting a gun safe or whatever, even putting it together. But my dad did find a picture of me and our son assembling the safe on our living room floor. There was a gun safe and a missing murder weapon. And the bullets from that weapon were identified as having been the same bullets as the ones that killed Shirley. I think maybe Bill felt that there should have been a search for that gun, a vigorous search for that gun. So in his suspicions against Jason, Bill felt that Jason had been given time to find it and get rid of it. These are the sort of assumptions that investigators made that really didn't have any evidentiary support, especially considering the evidence against other individuals. There were two brothers named Followell, Joel and John Followell. There was an individual named Joseph Sedlock. They were all implicated in different ways. And law enforcement would talk to them and get their alibi and never went and talked to their alibi to confirm whether or not that happened. Law enforcement had interviewed all these people, interviewed the family, still hadn't arrested anyone. Bill Carter thought that it was taking too long and decided to file the civil suit accusing his son, Jason Carter. Bill sued his son basically because he wanted to get criminal charges filed. He sued him because he wanted the evidence against his son that he felt that he had been able to unleash through this private investigation to come out in court. You know, I'm your flesh and blood. The last person, you know, you'd, you'd think you'd want to point the finger at. I honest to God think he lost his ever-loving mind when he walked in and uh, saw mom and it just, everything went to hell from there. So at the end of the civil trial, Jason Carter was found liable for his mother's death, responsible, essentially. The civil trial resulted in a verdict against Jason for $10 million. The district attorney's office felt that Jason Carter knew too many details and said some things that led them to the arrest. It doesn't make any sense. Hold the fridge, hold the floor. There's no blood. There's no blood. No splatter, no nothing that I can recall. Why do you need that? 
within two days, Jason was arrested and charged with murder. I think it was very obvious that the police questioning was accusatory. The questions were repeatedly, just tell us what happened. We know you're lying. Just tell us what happened. We know you're lying. No, no, no. Let me I just... want to say something real quick. Okay. So what if whoever out there that shot my mom, if they shoot another person here in the next day or two, how are you going to feel? I feel like we're doing our job. The prosecutors believed that the motive was marital problems. He had a 15-month affair with someone else. How often do you text and talk with Tara? Is that pretty frequent? Yeah. Made like no other. Two years after his wife was murdered, Bill Carter was successful in his $10 million civil suit against his son, Jason. And just two days after that judgment, Jason was charged with the first degree murder of his mother. Lacona was taking sides and the Carter family was being torn apart. On June 19th, Bill and Shirley got up with the son because for farmers, sunlight is money. They started their day with a light breakfast. Bill had a cup of coffee. What Bill didn't know, what he couldn't have known, is that would be the last time he ever saw his wife alive. As a lawyer, walking into the case where Jason has just been found civilly liable for $10 million and now charged with murder, it's a big hill to climb. Was Jason Carter planning on killing both his parents that day? I don't know. But I'm not required to prove to you why Jason Carter did what he did. I'm only required to prove to you that he did shoot and kill his mom. To understand the motive, you've got to understand that Bill had very strict philosophies about marriage. And Bill likely would have disowned Jason had he known that Jason was having an affair. There was information that surfaced during the investigation to indicate that Shirley actually knew about the affair and was possibly planning on telling Bill. I will say the state's right about one thing. They don't have to prove motive, but I do think you can look at was there a motive. The evidence will show there wasn't. Significant pieces of evidence weren't followed through. So when the state says to you, all clues point to one conclusion, it's all the clues that the tunnel vision of law enforcement and one investigator in particular went after. They were absolutely focused on Jason Carter and ignored all the other clues. The prosecutors believed that the motive for Jason to allegedly kill his mother was financial issues as well as marital problems. He had a 15-month affair with someone else, and they believed Shirley may have found out about that. Please be seated. On June 19th of 2015, did you communicate with Jason Carter? Yes. How did you usually communicate with Jason Carter? Uh, most of the time by text message. When I learned that my husband was not faithful, it was, you know, deeply disturbing and shocking. And, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen with our marriage. But I did know this, that my husband didn't have anything to do with his mom's death. We just had to put all that aside. And that was tough. How often do you text and talk with Tara? Is it pretty frequent? Yeah. So just throughout the day would be a normal... Yeah. Okay, so that phone was probably used more than your personal phone, do you think? Now, you said that you shared personal information. Did Jason Carter always speak positively about his mother? Yes. From what you could see, he appeared to love his mother? Yes. Did you ever have any sense that he was angry or mad at his mother? No. In fact, would you say he was close to his parents? Yes. The phone records were a key part of this case because it helped with the timeline for both Jason and Bill. 
based on your education, training, and experience, if the assertion was made that Jason Carter's handset never left <laughs> Street once it arrived there, do the forensics tell differently? Yes. Our office discovered that there were other suspects. Um, cell phones hanging off the towers near the time of the murder, including some who did not live anywhere near that area. So there'd be no reason for them to be passing through Lacona. It was really just one thing after another that started pointing at those three individuals. Part of your job is to protect Wells Fargo, isn't it? Correct. Protect their financial best interests. Correct. <laughs> Did you at any time have concerns about Jason and Shelley's ability to meet their financial obligations? No. The state thought there was a financial motive um, because Jason was slated to take over farming from his parents if and when they decided to retire. But if you look at Shirley's will, when she died, everything went to Bill. So. Jason had zero financial motive. At some point, did you have a conversation with Jason about why he didn't go into business with his father? Yes, I did. When did this conversation take place? I believe it was the fall of 14. And where were you when you actually had this conversation? In the combine cab, combining with Jason. What did Jason tell you? I asked why he didn't farm together with his dad. And his response was, I can't because my mom is a bitch. We had someone who called in and said, here's where the murder weapon is. We know someone who said there was a recording of these individuals talking about the murder. Regarding the homicide, what uh, circle did you know? I got a guy that admitted to him, or admitted to his brother. In 2019, four years after he found his mother shot dead on the floor of his parents' kitchen, Jason Carter was sitting at the defendant's table facing a first-degree murder charge. One of the biggest issues that the Carter family had from the start was the investigation by law enforcement. Did it take too long? Was evidence ignored? And did law enforcement point to Jason too quickly as the prime suspect without considering anyone else? 911, where is your emergency? I'm on the floor. What? Where is she, Dad? I don't know what happened. Send in an ambulance to you. I'm two hours. I don't get what happened. There's a hole through the floor. It was through the refrigerator. I don't know what she was trying to. I don't get what happened. I just walked in. County Okay. Okay. While several law enforcement officers were on the stand, they described the 911 call from Jason as almost too emotional, almost made it sound like he was faking it. What had occurred just before you radioed in to dispatch of this tape? Jason Carter called my cell phone. Prior to this phone call, did you know Jason Carter? I did. Could you understand what Jason Carter was trying to tell you? I could understand when um, he made the comment, she's dead, they killed her. Um, and then also in that conversation, I got out that uh, he said he needed help and they killed her. Other than need help, mom's been shot. Could you make out much of what else Mr. Carter was saying? No. There's some research that's been done regarding 911 calls and the expression of finality when a family member calls 911 regarding a victim and expresses finality rather than asking for help, then that's an indicator that, that they may be a participant in the offense itself. There's nothing that can be said right now that's going to make, obviously, anything better. But what we're, we, we just, we really need to concentrate on, on, on the crime scene, okay? It's just cold. Oh, I hope they here. <laughs> what, when you looked at this crime scene, were the important pieces of evidence that led you to the conclusion staging had occurred? 
as, as suspects stage crime scenes, they're under a tremendous amount of pressure. Um, and so they have to make things look like they think it should look. And this is most notable in just two sections of the house. And another important feature of this scene is it's very selective staging. In this particular case, one of the first things we noticed is that the prescription drugs in the jewelry boxes had not been disturbed. We don't know that nothing was taken. We don't know what happened. And so we realized it was a jump to say that this looks like a staged burglary. There were a number of things you did to follow up on this investigation, is that correct? Yes. You were also aware that neither Jason nor Bill's clothing were taken at the time of on June 19th, is that correct? Uh, I'm aware of that now. I'm not sure when I first became aware of that. I think there was already some discussion that you went to the house to collect um, a gun that had been missed. Yes. Law enforcement's theory is that Jason either hid the murder weapon under the hood of his truck or left the scene to hide the murder weapon and then came back before Bill Carter arrived. Has DCI or any member of law enforcement found Bill Carter's 270 bolt action rifle? No, we have not. Did you seize the gun safe? No. Why not? I didn't. Um really think anything of seizing the gun safe. It was unlocked, it was open, or at least the key was in the door, and I didn't think the gun safe had any evidentiary value. If a preponderance of evidence existed and did not come up and was not shared at trial, then I think it's unconscionable on the part of law enforcement. Every pursuit should have been thoroughly examined, explored. How many reports has the Marion County Sheriff's Department received indicating that Joe Sedlock, John Followell, or Joel Followell were involved in the murder of Shirley Carter. I do not know the number, but there's been a lot. More than 20? Could yes. be. We had someone who called in and said, here's where the murder weapon is. Didn't go follow up. Didn't go check to see if the murder weapon was there. Uh, we know someone who said there was a recording of these individuals talking about the murder. Didn't go try and get that. You received multiple reports about a suspicious white truck in the area of Street, Lacona, Iowa. Yes, I believe there's two or three. And you also received many, many reports implicating Joel Followell, John Followell, or Joe Sedlock, didn't you? I've heard the names that you mentioned, the, the, the Followells and, and Sedlocks. I do, I'm familiar with those people. I've heard those names, but I have not received, taken a report, an investigating report specifically on those people. It became more and more clear to us that these other individuals should have been looked at and never were. They were never really investigated as suspects. And in fact, we have emails very shortly after the murder occurred where the lead investigator told local law enforcement to stop following up on those leads because they had heard enough about those individuals. I thought Mark Ludwig knew what he was doing. I think this is his first homicide case. Oh, man, my mom drew the short end of the stick when she got him. You have directed the Marion County Sheriff's Department to stop following up on leads with regard to the Followells and Joe Sedlock, haven't you? We have been very clear with the Marion County Sheriff's Office and all law enforcement that there's any new information, any credible information, or any new information at all, we're gonna follow up on it. I think Tunnel Vision is, is very descript of what happened in this case. Um, you, you think something and you don't wanna be wrong and you push away any, any evidence or information that might contradict your internal belief. There was at least one allegation that Joel Followell made reference to the murder and his involvement in a jail phone call, wasn't there? That is correct, yes. Regarding the homicide, what, what uh, specifically do you know? A guy that admitted to it, or admitted that his brother did it. Okay, who's that? It's a follow-up. Follow-up? Mm -hmm. John and Joel's who I'm talking about. Okay. okay.
that that was a information we had received that Joel was in jail at the time that he made that confession over the phone, which I found incredibly unlikely because people don't confess to murders while they're in jail on the phone. I had never reported on a case where I saw this many things left out. Iowa DCI agent Mark Ludwig said during the trial, well, we missed some things, and by the time I found out we missed some things, it was too late. If I can get you to raise your right hand for me, please, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please be seated. I think everybody was moved by Bill Carter's testimony. This death of his wife was, you know, it destroyed him and it destroyed their family. I got a phone call from my daughter. What did you learn in that phone call? Uh, she said, uh, Dad, Mom's dead. And Jason found her and he won't call 911. You've got to call 911. I did not help Jana and Billy nearly as much as I did Jason. And Jason also helped you, too. There was a discussion In about... In what respect did he help me? Shirley and I did not want help. Jason Carter was standing trial for the 2015 murder of his mother in Lacona, Iowa. The state said Jason knew too much about the crime to be innocent. The defense said that law enforcement had bungled the investigation and it dropped the ball on other suspects. One thing was clear, Shirley's death had left the Carters a broken family. I found Shirley on the floor. And she was just looked like she was sleeping. The first thing I did was check her carotid artery. And she was dead. And then I picked her head up and I kissed her on the forehead. And she was cold. Bill, was anything broken in your home? No. Was your TV missing? No. Were any tools missing? No. Other than a 270 bolt action rifle, were any of your firearms missing? No. Were you sad? They say your life can change in an instant. It, it did, and it'll never be the same. Shirley certainly sounded like the glue of his life. I mean, Bill really relied on her for emotional interaction and support. He talked about the way she would get up every morning and make them breakfast and plan their day. She kind of did everything, and so she shared his perspective and his outlook, and my understanding is that they were just always extremely close. I did not help Jana and Billy nearly as much as I did Jason. Well. And Jason also helped you, too. There was a discussion about... In what respect did he help me? When you were taking crops out of the, the fields, he would... No, no. He was never done. I always went and helped him when Shirley and I got done. I didn't need any help. Shirley and I did not want help. We like to do things ourselves. Since Shirley's death, what we've heard is that no one is connected with anyone else in the family. All of the children talked to Shirley, made plans with Shirley. Shirley was the one who made sure that holidays occurred. And without Shirley, the family appears to have just completely dissolved. Jason Carter is stuck. Jason Carter is inconsistent on the things that directly link him to the crime. There's only two people in this world who know what happened on June 19, 2015. And one of them is dead, and the other one's sitting behind me. The state of Iowa requests that you find Jason Carter guilty of murder in the first degree. The thing we want the jury to know is that Jason had nothing to hide. 
here's the good and the bad. At the end of the day, we hope they'd see that the evidence didn't indicate that Jason was involved in the death of his mother. The state asserts that Jason Carter had all the answers, but the evidence really says Jason Carter was looking for answers. There were people who said, I heard a confession. It took more than a year, up to three years to follow up. There is just no way to say that's anything other than an incomplete, unfair, unjust investigation. I ask you to return a verdict of not guilty. It was under two hours when the jury gave the final verdict, so the people in the room really split as to who felt confident and who felt shaken and worried. But the main thing we all tried to do is just keep our cool and, and not jump to any conclusions and be ready for the best or the worst result. Form of verdict number one, we the jury find Jason Carter not guilty. Um, is that your verdict, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, it is. In light of the jury's verdict, I will enter a judgment of acquittal. Uh, any bond previously posted by the defendant uh, will be released and exonerated. I think the jury saw in this case the same thing that I did. There was an evidence implicating Jason. There were some guesses and there was some speculation, but there was really no solid evidence that implicated Jason from my perspective, and the jury basically said the same. Relief. Jason, how are you feeling hearing that verdict? I can't even talk, I'm sorry. I just wanna go home and see my kids. It's been a long time coming. I've had to endure so much. I have hope that someday the right individuals will be charged for my mom's murder and put behind bars forever. There's still information to work with. It's clearly a cold case, but um, Jason has been asking for additional investigation for a long time. It's hard to say if there will ever be a conclusive answer. Uh, it would be very hard to prosecute someone because the defense in that case could say, well, you've already said you had probable cause that it was someone else, but it's possible. My dad had the headstone made without my name on it. So it's hard to go there and visit and take our kids, and our kids, you know, they kind of still scratch their head to this day. I believed that the truth will set you free, but I'm gonna tell you that that's not always true. Friends and family say that Bill Carter has attempted suicide more than once in the wake of Shirley's murder. In an interview, Bill stated, quote, the worst time is when I wake up in the morning and I reach across the bed and she's not there. To this day, no one else has been charged for that crime. I'm Tamron Hall. Thank you for watching Someone They Knew.